What is up, guys? Coach Cheryl here with Fit Body Secrets, here to bring you guys inspiration, motivation, and a ton of tips to help you guys on your fitness journey. And happy freaking new year. It is 2023. And um, honestly, did not anticipate this to be my first podcast of the new year, um, but also is probably a, a very good timely one because I know a lot of people right now are getting ready to start some extremes in terms of like trying to change some habits. And this is a big one. I think that a lot of people like to label themselves as sugar addicts or food addicts, or they can't stop X, Y, Z eating behavior. And today I really want to dive into primarily food addiction. Um, is it a real thing, but really targeting around people that find themselves, I cannot stop eating sugar. I, I hear this all the time in different Facebook groups, online, in my uh, assessment forms is I am a sugar addict. I'm a sugar addict. And I want to know, is there really a truth behind this? I want to share with you guys, is there a really a truth behind this addiction behavior? So hopefully if you get any value out of this episode, or hopefully you do get some value out of this episode, if you do, please make sure that you let me know, shoot me a message, shoot me a DM, because I want to make sure that I'm able to help you guys out. Um, and if you are not already signed up for my challenge and you are looking to make some positive changes in the new year, also a plug for you guys to go ahead and get on that. And I'm not going to turn this into uh, 10 minutes of me talking about the challenge and that stuff. Because I'm going to be honest, when I'm listening to podcasts and for the first 10 minutes, I'm fast forwarding through ads of all the different sponsors. I'm usually bored and I'm like, all right, just get to the freaking, get to the, get to the podcast episode. And that's kind of what I want to do today. So um, I'm going to pull up some notes that I have because I want to make sure that I keep things organized for you guys. And I do have um, oh, I wanted to share a quick, I'm going to show, I'm going to share a photo with you guys as well too. And bear with me because I am still learning how to like add things on here. Uh, so give me a second downloads. I know I downloaded it. No, I desktop screenshotted it. Where did I put it? I have a, um, a little something, something that I did put together not a slideshow, but a picture that I wanted to show you guys. I see it, but how do I get it to present? Let's see, share screen. Oh. That might work actually. I don't know if it's gonna work or not, but I'm gonna try when I need to. We'll see, we'll see if it works. It might not work. Okay, so before we get into talking a little bit about food addiction, let's just talk about essentially what addiction is. Um, Essentially what an addiction is, it is, it's a description that refers to a condition in which a person compulsively engages in a reward-seeking behavior despite negative consequences. And so for a lot of people, we can think about things like drug addiction or gambling addiction. These people will often see a decrease in their life, obviously their, their finances, their social relationships, their health, um, just to seek out the reward that they get from those behaviors. And even though the DSM does not recognize food addiction as an actual condition, um, they have actually used a addiction scale and a questionnaire or a survey to help identify people with food addictive behavior. So they don't actually see it as a diagnosis, but they are also recognizing that a lot of the same things that happen with people that have addictions to drugs and alcohol and gambling and things like that portray a lot of the same traits as people that have a food addiction. But is it the actual substance that they're addicted to? Uh, like uh, tobacco or a nicotine substance, or is it the uh, behavior or the reward seeking pleasure point that they're actually addicted to, which is where it gets a little bit fuzzy. So uh, what I want to show you guys here is because before we go into food addiction, I want you guys to understand what addiction looks like in terms of, are you experiencing these things? And if you call yourself a food addict or a sugar addict, ask yourself how many of these things you guys can actually check off. So let me see if this is going to work if I can um, pull it up. Let's see. I'm really hoping. Let's see if this is going to work. Yeah, I think you guys can see it. Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and do this then. All right, hopefully this is big enough for you guys to see. I made a screenshot of it. So this is the um, Yale Food Addiction Scale. And they've taken this from the, obviously the DSM in, in terms of identifying people with having actual drug addictions or other addictive behaviors. Um, so you see the first thing on there, if you if you can check off three out of seven of these things, they technically say that you technically have some type of an addictive behavior related to that, that substance. So the substance tends to be consumed in larger amounts or over larger periods than intended. 
Um, now, if you're somebody that like every once in a while, it's Christmas and you've eaten a little bit too much food, likely not the case. If uh, you're the kind of person that when you sit down to a bag of Snickers minis, you have three and you eat the whole bag and then you have another whole bag and then you're actually looking for more of those foods, that might be a sign of a substance triggering uh, an addictive behavior. But it's really important for you guys to recognize that it has to come from that place of like, you are literally causing negative, you are, you are really going out of the way to achieve or to get that substance. It's not just like, oh, I ate 10 instead of three. It's like, no, I ate the whole bag and now I'm going out to the store to get more of them, okay? Reducing time spent on important recreational, social, or work-related activities because of consumption. So if you are actually avoiding going out, um, you're avoiding you know, being around other people, you're avoiding going to work, you're avoiding doing those things, that could be a sign that you have a food addiction. Um, persistent desire to unsuccessfully attempt to stop or curb consumption. So um, you are so addicted to this food that you're not willing to give it up. Like you will, you will seek it out at whatever cost. And it's not even in your thought process to try and remove it, even if you feel guilty about it. Continuing consumption despite negative physical or psychological consequences. So you can't stop eating it. Also with alcohol, right? We keep doing it because we want it. Spending a lot of time on activities related to consumption or recovering from consumption, aka I ate a whole bunch. Now I'm going to binge and restrict or I'm going to restrict from that. Um, needing more of it of the substance to achieve the desired effect. This is a big one. So maybe you used to be satisfied on one or two. Now you need like five or six. And then the main one is withdrawal symptoms. You actually get a very unpleasurable response from not getting it. So those were some of the things that I want to just kind of show you guys in terms of what addiction actually looks like, because I think it's really easy to, to label yourself an addict if really it's just like, I wanted an extra piece of candy. And this is where you have to understand the difference between like, food rules and restriction versus like, I'm actually addicted to this substance. Are you continuing to tell yourself you shouldn't be having this thing? Or are you so addicted to it that you can't not have it? There is a huge difference between those two things. So that was the main thing I wanted to kind of cover when I, before I kind of started to dive into this a little bit and give you guys a little bit more information on it. So, um, it's very similar with food addictions. Um, cause I'm looking at my notes. In terms of addictions with like things like drugs, alcohol, gambling, things like that, food addiction does tend to be very similar in the way it manifests in behavior. So it might not be as extreme, like you might not be like, well, you might be going broke trying to buy certain foods, but you're not going to literally wipe out your savings account to go, you know, buy the candy. Also, the cost of the food is much cheaper than the cost of gambling. So that could also be the thing. And that's where it's so important we guys have to understand when we're looking at studies, there's so much context that has to be put into consideration and correlations versus causations and things like that, that what I really want you guys to take away from this is that um, the main thing I'm trying to get at here is that with food addictions, a lot of the behaviors are going to be similar to what you're going to get with any addictions, but it does not necessarily mean that you're addicted to the food or you're addicted to sugar. It's the behavior and the reward that we're seeking from those foods. And that is where we can kind of go into how we can kind of overcome those things. There is no actual food addiction diagnosis in the DSM. So if you are labeling yourself as a food addict, that is not a true thing. Uh, if you tell yourself that you're a sugar addict, that is not a true thing. Um, however, it does not mean that you don't have the desire to eat sugar to, to seek that reward, uh, that reward pathway in your brain. So now we're going to go into some of the more reasons why this happens. The brain systems underlying drug addictions are the same systems that motivate us to seek natural rewards like sex and food. So if we have a drug addiction... The, the brain is going to stimulate the same thing as we do when we're looking for food and sex. Those are the exact same pathways. And that's why we often will see that addiction, food addiction manifests very much like a drug addiction or an alcohol addiction, or it might feel the same way. However, studies in animals report that food doesn't stimulate them nearly as much as highly addictive drugs of abuse. And this is part of the reason why the food addiction concept is controversial. Doesn't mean that the behavior is not bad. It just means that it's not as bad as the, the withdrawal symptoms that you're going to get from a drug addiction. Some research also argue that certain amounts, certain modern foods stimulate these systems to a greater degree than anything our dist distant ancestors would have eaten regularly. This is where we can talk about the types of foods that we're eating. And I'm going to go over this all in a little bit more of a, my interpretation of way, but I would, I really wanted to get out the bullet points of what I want to talk about. Um, some research, like I mentioned, argue that modern foods stimulate these systems 
to a greater degree than anything our distant ancestors would have eaten regularly. Modern processed foods tend to be more concentrated in the nutrients that stimulate brain motivational systems, especially fats and carbohydrates. This may result in a stronger motivation to acquire and eat these foods, and in some people could lead to addiction-like eating behaviors. In support of this, research suggests that calorie-dense processed foods rich in refined carbohydrates and fats are more likely to trigger addiction-like eating behaviors, while simple unprocessed foods are less likely to trigger these behaviors. And I'm going to stop there and talk about this, because this is the main piece of this entire podcast right here. Okay, so when we talk about things like food quality versus macros, um, you have to take into factor is what are you struggling with, okay? If you are eating a lot of processed foods and you are also having a hard time stopping eating and losing weight because you can't stop consuming those foods, removing those foods from your diet might help fix that behavior and that need because when you no longer are getting that hit all the time, which we're going to go into next, you might actually stop craving those things. It does happen. It takes time, but your body will stop to look for those things. And I'm going to go into why next. Um, and this is where food quality plays a huge factor. You are less likely to get addicted to eating chicken, broccoli, and brown rice versus having chips and ice cream and things like that, correct? So it's just because they are setting off different signals. The second piece of this is that you mentioned and talked about carbs and fats together because those really are, that combination is like the number one thing that causes that overconsumption, that need to overeat because it stimulates so much especially when we add textures and different tastes and things like that. So when it's also like the sweet and salty combination on top of the sugar and the salt, like all of that matters. So recognizing that food quality and higher processed foods are more likely to be addictive than your obviously more whole foods. This isn't like, oh my gosh, I shouldn't be eating processed foods. Or I shouldn't be eating those foods. It's understanding that if you're eating them as a whole source of your calories, you are likely having to overconsume them because you are also wanting more of those calories you're likely overconsuming them because of that. Um, a couple of other things that I wanted to mention to you is that they did do studies. And I will tell you, it's the other thing about research study guys is, is that most studies are done on rodents. And although that's a great metric me measure for kind of doing, cause a lot of their properties are similar, it's still not a human being. So always know that all of these things being done on rodents aren't always like the best way for you to do. Oh, it's going to be the same for us, but they do have a lot of similar properties. Now, what they do find is that when it comes to things like addictive like behavior, substance tolerance, meaning we build up a tolerance of things, substance withdrawals, addiction like neurochemistry, so changes in the brain to help stimulate the need for those things, and actually obesity, the model that has the, the most effect on um, like weight and everything like that, and, and the one that has the most is the sweet fat model. So the ones that have the most addictive behaviors the most, uh, uh, the most, let me just pull this up. Let me just show you this real quickly. Let me just get this because it's going to be easier for me to show you. And if you're not on my YouTube channel, you're missing out. Let me just go ahead and pull this up. Share. Okay. So, all right. So all of these models, they have a sugar binging model, a fat binging model, and then a sweet fat model. So the sugar binging model, let's just say you crave sugar. So it's like candy that's just high in sugar with no fats. Like uh, think like gummy bears, gummy worms, things like that. Fat binging model is high fat foods. Um, this might be like your cheeses and things like that, which is actually fat and proteins. Uh, and then your sweet fat model, those are going to be like your cookies, your cakes, your ice cream. You can see here that the one that triggers the most is that sweet and fat combo. The only one it doesn't really present it with is that substance withdrawal. And you can see the only one that really has a substance withdrawal is the sugar only model. Why do you think that is? Because the sugar only model is going to cause that super big rise in blood sugar and then that huge fall down. That's why we're typically going to see that, which is natural. That's your body compensating for obviously changes in your blood sugar. It's like, Hey, I'm running low on blood sugar. Now let's bring me back up again. But that sweet fat model is the one to watch out for the most. That's why I just wanted to pull that up really quickly. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to kind of mention to you is that, um, when it comes to like, how do I beat? Well, let's actually just start to take a second back. Let me just kind of go back one second. I want to make sure I'm keeping this orderly with what I want. Okay. All right. Now I know where I wanted to go with this. Okay. So as I'm talking about um, everything with, you know, food addictions and drug addictions, where are the similarities between the two? All right. And this is where I want to talk about what's going on in our brain. When it comes to addiction, we are looking for something. We are we are seeking out something, that pleasure-seeking thing. 
This is typically come by the motivational chemical dopamine. Dopamine is your body's neurotransmitter that's responsible for that pleasure seeking. It, it's, it allows our body to feel pleasure. And there's a couple of things about dopamine you guys have to understand. One, we do build, build up a tolerance to it. So we need more of it as, as we get used to the amount that we're getting in. So um, we get dopamine hits all the time throughout our, head, our day. Those of you guys that have a hard time stopping scrolling through social media, that is looking for dopamine. Um, exercise raises your dopamine levels. Um, food raises your dopamine levels. All of these things, sex raises your dopamine levels. All these things are going to affect your, your dopamine levels. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, it is good. We want, we need those things. It actually helps us with our mood and other things. And, and we need dopamine because there's also conditions that we can get from not having enough dopamine. However, but like I said, because we can build up a tolerance to it, we tend to need more dopamine hits. And that's where food addiction can kind of come in because we're looking for that. And this is where people that are maybe like, even like with a uh, being overly stressed and they're overworked, they're looking for some kind of a pleasure seeking response, something, something to get out of that, that stressful feeling, that, that, that anxious feeling. And that's what they're looking for those dopamine hits for. They do find that a lot of those foods that are high in fats and carbohydrates, like chocolate, ice cream, pizzas are going to be larger producers of dopamine, like dopamine stimulating nutrients then those that are lower calorie foods and that don't combine a lot of those foods together. So it's really important for you guys to understand that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on when we talk about addiction. Okay. So I know I've kind of rattled off a lot of things and I want to kind of take a second now that I've kind of read a lot and kind of give you guys my interpretation of what I'm trying to kind of feed out to you guys. And by the way, I am reading directly from examine.com is a great resource for those of you guys that are looking for research-based um, a lot of peer-reviewed studies that are, that takes the guesswork out of things. Um, and now I'm going to kind of interpret to you guys how I want you guys to understand what I'm trying to say to you. Is Number one is there is no recognition of food addiction in the DSM. So even if you think you're a sugar addict, you really can't label yourself a sugar addict. That does not mean that you don't crave sugar and that you don't have a need for sugar or that you don't have a need for these sweets and foods that you can't seem to get yourself to stop eating. Your body is looking for dopamine and you're getting it from those foods. So when it comes to beating sugar addictions, food addictions, as you want to call yourself, um, you have to understand that what you're looking for is dopamine. And why are you not getting enough of it in your, in your life? Are you overstimulated? And now you feel there's such a tolerance that you need more dopamine, in which case that is usually the case when people have entirely too much on their plate. They are stressed to the max. They are busy to the top and they are always looking for something else. That's, that's the typical personality there. And they're getting it from food. Some people get it from other places. Some people get it from exercise. Some people get it from gambling, whatever it is, you're getting it from food. So it is similar in properties as those things. However, the withdrawal symptoms and a lot of the negative consequences aren't quite so bad. It's mostly affecting the way you look and the way you feel, not necessarily, and maybe to a degree your health, but probably not as much, maybe some of your relationships, but mostly it's going to be those things, not so much in relationships and your finances. Um, but those pleasure seeking rewards are what you're looking for from those foods. Now, how can we overcome this addiction, quote unquote, to these foods and to these things? This is where a lot of people try and go on these. I've got to cut shit out. I've got to cut it out altogether, cut out the sugar. And it's really not the sugar that we're looking to cut out. It's we're looking to cut out these processed foods. And for those people out there that do have a hard time cutting or eating these foods without overdoing it, you should be spending some time actually taking yourself from the reliance on them from dopamine and seeking the other places. So I'm all on board with going on what you would like to call a quote unquote detox, which is really not what it is. You're just cutting those things out. Um, but the problem comes is that when these people are cutting out these foods in order to stop craving them, which is the goal they're not replacing them with the nutrients. So what happens is they become nutrient deficient now, and now they're craving these foods and they're not having enough nutrients on board. It makes the cravings worse. So it is important for you guys to recognize that if you guys, if you guys are operating in a way to help remove foods to fix sugar addictions and food addictions, that's a good thing to do. It's a good behavior to try and correct. However, we have to know what foods we should be replacing them with. So um, if you are eating a lot of cookies, pizzas, uh, processed foods, restaurant foods, high in salt, high in sugar, high in fats, high in carbs all together, 
Starting by bringing your diet to a minimally processed one is important, but that does not mean cutting out carbs, cutting out fats, cutting out things and only eating chicken and vegetables. It means finding better sources of those nutrients. So you can call macros a diet. It's not a fucking diet. It's at the bottom of every single diet. Food quality plays a factor in that just because you're tracking your macros. If you're eating all these processed foods, you're not fixing that problem. You might be correcting some of the imbalances, but you're not fixing that problem. So my method is always going to be built around getting you guys to understand that you don't have to label yourself an addict. You can understand that you have a problem. I got a problem. I like sweets, but we all like sweets. Um, and learn to correct those things the right way, which means feeding your body, not starving your body. So it comes down to eating a minimally processed whole food based diet. Lots of lean proteins, vegetables, fruits, starchy carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates from whole grains, rice, potatoes, things like that. I will always say this. When people tell me that they're addicted to carbs, I'm like, if I put a bowl of brown rice in front of you, I highly doubt you would overeat it because nobody's going to sit there with a bowl of brown rice in front of them and just keep eating it until they're like, they're not going to want that much. Now, if you take that bowl of brown rice and you add some salsa, some cheese, some guacamole you know, maybe something with some crunch on it, you're going to be like, I could eat a lot more of this now because it's got all of those flavors built in together. But when you're basing your diet on more minimally processed things, you will start to overcome those needs for those foods. So you want to base your diet always on a high quality whole food based diet. And then from there, we can dial in the macronutrients of that diet. It does not mean also that you have to avoid these foods altogether. Like I said, this is not an actual criteria in the diagnosis. So we're like an alcoholic may never be able to drink alcohol again. Just because you have a problem overeating sugar doesn't mean that you're never going to be able to have a cookie again. It means you have to understand the relationship that you have with food right now and replace that relationship with something else, which is part two, is that we have to learn how to find dopamine and pleasure seeking processes in other areas of our life besides foods. There are some times where food is the pleasure. Uh, we are out with friends and we're having some drinks and some appetizers. Uh, it's Christmas dinner, things like that. But there are other times where the, the pleasure should come from somewhere else. And, and that's where exercise can come in. That's where, you know, doing things with friends and family can come in. Getting outdoors can come in. Just other things that make you happy in life. Listening to music, um, watching a TV show, uh, other things that can help reading a book, bring fulfillment and giving you that dopamine, even finding things to work on in your own personal self, your own personal goals. So a little bit of a, a long talk today. And I know I kind of went a little bit all over the place a little bit because sugar addiction is something that I think a lot of people like to label themselves as, but, but here's the deal. It's not really an addiction. It is similar to an addiction. Um, and you might have some of the same symptoms, but it's something you can actually overcome. So uh, that's pretty much it guys today. Um, it's new year's day. Um, I do have a challenge starting up, like I said, next week, if you are looking to get kind of get on board in the new year with making some positive changes the right way, um, definitely join in on the challenge. It's free. Starts January 8th with our kickoff call and uh, we'll go from there. I'm going to just hop over to the comments. I do see some people sitting in there. Happy new year. Bruce says that sugar is like cocaine and absolutely. They do say that there is a lot of similar um, with the, the rodent studies I was reading about that there is a lot of similarities to where the sugar is manifested or the way we, we experience sugar in our body as cocaine. They did say that there was a similarity to that. So um, I'm a cookie monster. Don't care for candy or chocolate. I love cookies as well. Um, in fact, I'm going to be honest. I do get down on some Lenny and Larry's cookies and they had a really good, which is not really a cookie. I know it's a healthy cookie, but uh, they have a peppermint bark, peppermint chocolate cookie. That was actually really, really good. I enjoyed that over, over the weekend. So um, that's it guys. Happy new year. Um, I'm hoping, hopefully going to get to meet some of you guys in my challenge. And if not, I'll see you guys on my next episode. Talk soon.